start. Okay, let's start with the third talk. It's uh, Lin Jing Feng from the Kuwin Institute of Science and Technology, and his topic is about the connectivity mapping in the brain. Thanks. Okay, it's a great pleasure to have a chance here to present our work about the mapping brain connectivity using light microscope. So a lot of neuron scientists want to know the connection between the uh, brain network and the behavior. But first, we want to know what's the pattern of the network. So we have, especially, we want to know where the synapse is. Um, before, um, the, the overlap region between the extent of the presynaptic region and the postsynaptic region uh, was used to infer the existence of the synapse, but it's not actual synapse, it's just a probability. It just shows the probability of synapse. Um, we know that less than half of the axon which passed by a dendrite will, will all form the synapse. And another way to uh, uh, get the synapse locations use the electron microscope, but because of the high resolution of the electron microscope, it takes a long time to reconstruct an even small region of the brain. Uh, so, and then now we have the m -grasp. M-grasp is uh, based on the sweet GFP technique. So we engineered uh, two parts of the GFP and uh, we put the target the first part into the presynaptic region and the target the second part into the post-synaptic region. Um, when the two parts uh, form the actual synapse, it will see the fluorescence. Um, so we can see the actual uh, what synapse uh, signal looks like. You can see channels where it's neuron, the neural is axon, and, uh, and the synapse. Now let's, uh, now let's get a 3D view of the, uh, of the neuron. And uh, what we are focused on this study is about the first channel, which is M-grasp. We are trying to uh, use a computer to uh, build the brain mapping, uh, which is we try to detect the synapse from the image. And uh, to try to uh, map in the brain connectivity, we need to know the number of the synapse, size of synapse, the size of, size of synapse signals uh, turn out to be important because uh, the angles of the study shows that uh, big and the ellipse size, uh, elliptic size, uh, and grasp will always indicate is a kind of inhibitory connection, and the small and round size functor usually indicate is an excitatory connection. So size is very important, and we want, of course, we want to know the location and know the dendrite and axon to form the whole network. So uh, to be able to detect the synapse signals, so we want, uh, first we want to remove the background. And since our image is relatively clean, so we try to use a global threshold to remove the background. And the threshold is determined uh, using the local maxima histogram. It's based on the fact that we observed that uh, most of the local maxima, region, local maxima region of the image is caused by background noise. So we think we can determine the threshold between the uh, background and foreground uh, using local maxima histogram. This is what we do. So. Uh, first, uh, we get the, um, uh, we crop out the region uh, of the, um, of the, from the maximum of the frequency to the lowest of frequency and then we normalize the histogram, which makes uh, the intensity uh, and the frequency have the same scale. And uh, then we can determine the threshold by uh, finding the minimum of the summation of the intensity and the frequency. And uh, you can see the results of the removal the background, which is much clearer than before. And uh, then uh, after the removal background, the image can be separated into many connected components. And uh, if, the, if the actual synapse signal is, is isolated, it's fine. You can just get the size and location. But if the several signals are connected, we need to find a way to separate these things. Uh, so, uh, what, what, so it's come to a question, uh, what identifies a single synapse signal? So uh, after inspecting the image, we choose two uh, morphology features to use to detect the single uh, synapse. And the first feature we, uh, we observe that most of the synapses have a bright center because it's a fluorescent signal. And uh, some of it don't have, not 100%, and some of it don't have the bright center. Uh, maybe because it's too small or the signal is too dim. So, uh, may, uh, so uh, for that, for those 
don't have to use uh, shape features. So based on these two features, we design sequential methods which use uh, all these features one by one. And so f the first uh, uh, first step, uh, we were trying to uh, separate the signals based on the center, fe center features. Uh, that is, uh, which, uh, this is the first of step of our method, so we try to be very careful not to do some, any over segmentation, and we try to, to separate uh, the a collective component to many regions, uh, which, which each region contains one bright center. Uh, so it contains at least uh, one synapse. So what we do is use a watershed, uh, and uh, uh, we use a size threshold to control, whether the, the, control the size of the bright center. Uh, you can see the example. So we can find the first image. We got a, a 3D view of the connected components, and uh, we got uh, this component contain four synapses, and the three of the synapses contain bright center, and the, the other ones are a little bit dim. So using the wall shed uh, as, ex as expected, we can separate the connected component in three parts. So next, we try to use the shape features because some of the synapses are not are not separated. So we try, uh, with, since we are seeing that some, uh, most of the synapses kind of around the shape, uh, so we can naturally we want to model it like model it like a mixture of Gaussians. And what we are trying to do is from the observed data, uh, from the observed data to infer the parent of the Gaussians. So our observed data is a list of voxels, the image voxels, and each voxel has a density. Um, we can think of the density as a duplicated observation, which means we observe the, the signal in this location multiple times, and we can expand these, all these observations, and uh, we get a standard Gaussian, Gaussian mixture model. And uh, one, impo uh, one important uh, parameter of the Gauss Gaussian mixture model is the number of Gaussians. Uh, to get the parameters, we need uh, to decide how many components it should have. But this, this is something we should, we haven't know yet. We need to decide. We need to uh, get an uh, optimal number from the data. So we use uh, variational pH Gaussian mix models, uh, which is uh, more. I think this is more elegant than the general Gaussian mix models because it can automatically detect. Uh, and it automatically decides the optimal number for the number of Gaussians. So what we do is give it the initial number of Gaussians, and uh, based on the prior probability, it will generate a list of Gaussians. And uh, each, each Gaussian is based on the prior probability, and then uh, we can use it. Then the data will drive, the, drive some of the Gaussian components to from this initial state. So after the after the whole process, uh, some of these uh, models will be responsible for explaining the data, but some of it uh, will just in just this in this initial states. So we can remove those components. Mm. Mm. And uh, so we want uh, we need no know that in the so the model can be computed in a very similar style. Of to the general Gaussian mix models, which is like a EM step. And uh, in, the e in the M step, we fix the responsibility and we calculate the um, optimum model parameters. And in this step, we need to consider the image intensity of each voxels. And in the E step, we need to uh, fix the model parameter and get the responsibility of each data. Since uh, this responsibility is already related to the uh, voxel location, so we can just uh, calculate for each voxel rather than all the observations. Uh, after this step, uh, uh, we hope that the uh, uh, optimum number of components gets by the by the uh, by the variation based so Gaussian mix model is the correct number of synapses, but sometimes it's not working well. So I can think of some re some reasons is because our signals. So if you look at the signal very carefully, it's, it's not look like it's generated from one Gaussian distribution. Sometimes the signal can have very strange shapes. Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, down uh, upper image, you can see that from front side it looks okay, but 
uh, uh, microscopy really have a bad Z resolution. Therefore, um, therefore, uh, the Gaussian mix model might not give us the correct result. So what should we do? Now we have a list of uh, list of Gaussian models. Uh, we don't know the underlying model, uh, actual underlying models. So we try to use the feature space across the method, which is the mean shift. Uh, by, by applying the mean shift to each Gaussian component, uh, we can uh, we can move each com result component to a nearest stationary point, and then by examining the overlap rate of the Gaussians, we can merge Gaussian as they have a high overlap rate. Uh, and uh, finally, we can get to the correct result. And this region is correct and is correctly separated into four parts. And uh, then we are going to uh, talk about the accuracy of this method. Uh, accurate, so we also choose some other pro other method and uh, do some comparison. And the first method we choose is graph cut. Uh, it's not actually designed for detect this kind of signal. It's designed designed for separate 3D or 2D nucleus. But the separation part is similar. We wanted to know whether their separation method is better or ours. And, and the second one is was used in the original Ngrass paper. And it's based on the template matching method. And we also created two other methods by removing one stage of our, our method, which show which we're trying to show that the combination of the both methods actually provide better results. So what we do is uh, choose three cells and uh, choose a lot of region from the cell. And uh, we manually inspect all the detection results uh, um, by some expert, in which in our case is, is, uh, is, uh, was inspected by the inventor of MCROSS, which is to know the signals better. And, uh, Finally, we get the accuracy and the, all the other parameters, which show that our, our method has actually has the highest, highest precision, accuracy and the precision. And uh, I can show two example regions of how our method compared to other methods. So I can use a little red arrow to show the problematic region of each method. So we can see uh, no, most of the serial problem of other methods is that uh, several regions are not correctly separated, which is the same for the uh, single step method, uh, which also shows that our method can actually uh, combine the strengths of the both method and provide a better result. And, uh, um, no uh, algorithm is 100% accurate, and sometimes so we do want 100% result. So what we do is like uh, uh, we provide a proof editing method. So uh, based on our, on our uh, models, we can get a confidence score for each detection, and uh, and uh, if the number of the functor is small enough, we can use a color map. It can easily support the problematic region by using by using the color. Or if it's a number is too many, we can build a list, and we can edit this uh, one by one. And to be able to edit, uh, edit, we need to provide a simple interface which uh, which supports this. Uh, Simple navigation, so which from the data to the 3D location, and uh, if we think the result is not correct, so we can just uh, split this, uh, split this into several parts, and if we think it's over segmented, we can just uh, select it and uh, and merge all this into. And after detection of the punctures, we still need to decide the, the related digits because we try to build a network. So um, now we have the uh, uh, digit digital model, which is the commonly used by neuron scientists. It's a list of node structure, and each node have a radius. If we can, if we can connect it. Uh, uh, two radios by the cylinder, we can get a tube-like models. And uh, besides the neuron, we get the background, and because 
and uh, we get all the detected synapse, and we try to decide where the synapse belongs to. So first, let me uh, let we see the uh, digital model. So from the digital model, we have two branches, and we do have a uh, punctus. Uh, we want to so from digital model, it looks like. Uh, the synapse is more close to branch one, so we might think it's, be, it's uh, belong to branch one. But uh, but from the image, from the image, we can see that uh, branch two has a spine, and the synapse is on top of the spine. So actually, it should belong to branch two. It's, it's because our uh, digital model is simplified. It's, uh, therefore, we can't just rely on the digital model. We need to use a uh, is a weighted distance, which means so we build a graph uh, from this region of image, uh, and the, the weight of weight of uh, weight of this graph between two nodes is defined as below, and uh, we, this this turns out to be a multi-source, multi-target shortest path problem, and solving the problem, we can assign the synapse to a correct branch. Um, the, the weight between two branches uh, have two parameters. So the first one is the threshold. The threshold is, quite, is actually similar to the, our prior, previous global threshold, but is, except that we apply this method to the neuron channel, not the synapse channel. And the scale is all related to the image bit depth. And uh, finally, we can um, assign different color uh, by different source. And we got our final network mapping network. And uh, this is two of our co-authors. And uh, Dr. Tin Zhao and I designed the whole method and the analysis pipeline. And uh, Dr. Jin Hui Kim um, is the inventor of MGrasp and he he calcul she calculated all the accuracy of each algorithm. The source code of this method can be downloaded from our lab website. Also, you can find more about our research on our lab website. And this work was supported by WCI of Korea and the Natural Science Foundation of China, and the presentation was supported by Channel Fellowship. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yep. Uh, usually, f hmm? uh, for the automatic detection, we usually have the image of a size like a four two gigabytes. It's run like twenty minutes to get all the cinema signals. Uh, the addition will take, uh, de depends on the result, I think. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much again. Thank you.